This is uh, Digital Music Trends 164 on the 1st of January 2014. This week on the show, I recap of DMT's interviews recorded on location at conferences around the world in 2013. You can find the full interviews as well as many more I recorded on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends and soundcloud.com slash digitalmusictrends. Hello everyone and Happy New Year! Welcome to Digital Music Trends 2013 interviews recap from conferences around the world, including extracts from Medem, South by Southwest, the World Creators Summit, Future Music Camp, Ames Music Connected and the Ultimate Seminar. It was a busy year for DMT but it's going to be an even busier one in 2014 as I'm planning to bring you lots of new shows and cover as many events as humanly possible. As I mentioned in the past couple of shows, if you tune in every week and would like to contribute, there's now an option for a voluntary subscription on digitalmusictrends.com and the proceeds will go mostly towards covering operational costs including server space uh, for the shows. And we start the tour with my chat with international classical music star Lang Lang at Medium 2013 talking about streaming, social media and more. First of all, let's talk about how music is consumed. Uh, you know, social media, you're a big uh, you know, proponent of social media and you, and you uh, are on Twitter and Facebook a lot. How do you see people really uh, engaging with uh, not just yourself but also your music through channels like you know Spotify and all these new streaming sites that are out there uh, yeah I think all those new platforms such as Spotify I think it's a very cool idea yeah and uh, um, and we all uh, create pages uh, personal artist pages on those wonderful new uh, platform for uh, distributing music absolutely um, and I think we need that actually. We we actually need the platform to share classical music. Yeah. Uh, and not only music itself, but also educational component. Sure. Um, I think it's also important, like master class, uh, the uh, educational events. Yeah. Uh, very creative uh, programs. Um, Absolutely. So I think there are many things we can do, you know, with do, those, yeah, with those uh, ideas. Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about uh, being in the studio and uh, recording an album? H how do you go about that process? And do you get involved at all in, in you know, uh, the this, this sound of your piano and how your piano sounds in the recording? Yeah, I, I think more and more I'm going to be involved. Uh, first recording, you, you know, you talk to your producer and, and get a lot of uh, great suggestion from, you know, the recording team. Yeah. But then, you know, you listen many years later you, you you and you're recording your current uh album you find how you know how do you change from those years and, uh, yeah. and what's the process and now obviously when i make a recording i have something to say about what kind of sound i want to hear yeah which is very important otherwise you will never find yourself no. you need to have exactly. certain identity uh, from your recordings yeah. it's a different than live recording it's very different when you are in the studio there's a lot of rooms you can you can try to to really being part of the recreation uh, and and that's the fun part in the studio yeah you know today if you're not happy stop yeah. <laughs> making a recording and come back tomorrow. Not like concert. You, you, no matter how happy or how sad you are, <laughs> you need to play well. <laughs> yeah, <know>? absolutely. <laughs> so it's a different uh, situation. Sure. Also, like uh, there's a lot of application on the iPad coming out, for sure, for example, sure. and tablets that are helping yeah. people to learn music. Uh, but the, of course, there's a piece of the, of the pu puzzle, which is the teacher, which really needs to be central still to music education because technology cannot replace you know, humans uh, and, yeah, and teachers. Yeah, it's, it's hard to replace. I mean, seriously, we can do a lot of fun projects. Uh, as I also uh, done a lot of things on, on apps before. Uh, but the real concert uh, in a real concert hall is are still the, the best to go. Um, so I think the best way is to learn basic education on the internet, on the internet, and then come to see a real concert as yeah. a real inspirational. Uh, content. Yeah, yeah. And continuing on at Medium, I talked with uh, Kevin Wartis from a New York based company Girly Action about the importance of uh, label services. I, I think that the, the economic environment is really ripe for more artists to want to do, take advantage of label services as opposed to a proper record company. A record company now can really provide um, three things one, branding which yeah. is crucial. If an artist has an opportunity to sign to 4AD, 
um, that's really going to take them places that they could not do if they self-released with no curation. And that's what good proper label branding does. And I think there's a lot of room for that and, and can be very successful for artists. The other thing that artists can really take advantage of from labels is them being a bank. Yeah. Um, and the last one is the services that are within a label company. So if you've got artists that do not need the branding um, or can't get it um, and have the money on their own, if they bet on themselves, they're going to make five, six, seven times the money have all the control. And this is particularly effective if the artist uh, gets a lot of sinks. Of course, yeah. Yeah, because that's where the real money is. Um, and they're no longer beholden to a label. So we see a lot of people coming off of, of major label deals and checking in and seeing whether this is something they want to do. And some of them don't want to do it when they see what the price tag is. Yeah, of course. Uh, some of them dive right in and make a lot of money. Right. So yeah, it's it's kind of... You know, the artists have to take the bat upon themselves at this point, rather than the label having to take the bat upon the artist. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, and so, uh, talking about label services, there, there's so much stuff that goes into it in terms of coordinating. You know, we're talking about the fact that, uh, you know, some of your staff, of course, delegated to specific functions within the label services division. Um, so, how do you decide, uh, as a company, what you're going to do in-house and what you're going to outsource? Okay. I joined Girly Action two years ago, and they're an 18 going, yeah, 18 year old PR firm. So the engine that drives Girly Action and, and and the experience that informs everything what we do is is PR and marketing. And we've got four teams that really just hammer out press. And in the U.S., as opposed to say the U.K., that means print media, dailies, TV, online, all of it. Uh, we've also now got a fairly robust management division, um, and so. Those things are in place. I came in and brought in really the hub of what we do is project management. And we've grown. Um, and our first step in terms of growth was bringing in digital marketing and social media. And there's a lot of demand for that. And that is really where an artist can either maintain and communicate with fans um, or build a fan base. And increasingly, and there's going to be a lot of talk about this at, at Meetem this year, um, where they can coalesce everything that's happening with PR, everything that's happening with radio, and monetize it vis-a-vis -vis direct to fan initiatives, yeah. crowdsourcing if that's something that they're comfortable with. Not every artist is. And we can tie it all together, and we can sort of traffic control it um, and and run it. with Without a robust social media platform, none of that could work. How do you manage the expectations of the fans towards, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, we've seen like uh, there's some backlashes on, on certain decisions or the fans asking questions about how the money is being used exactly. And, and, and how do you face uh, those problems in, in, a, in a way that makes it like good for everyone? Total transparency. Yeah. To the extent that the artist is comfortable with it. But it, it, all the messaging has to be authentic. All of it has to be true. There's no room for bullshitting in this new arena. There's no, you, you, anything that, that is, has a whiff of, of falsehood or pretense uh, is so abundantly obvious now. Yeah. And we really encourage our clients to be not only truthful, but to embrace the fact that their fans love them for that. They want to be as, the, the whole, um, sense of mystique of of an artist where you know we are the audience and we're down here and you are the artists who we adore you're up here that's kind of gone at this point now um and they want to be able to speak as directly as possible the artist in total transparency so in the event that there's backlash and we've seen it it's really um taken care of with dialogue and discussion and that doesn't mean that we're that the artist ultimately convinces their fan base that what they did was right, but they are convincing in their uh, heartfelt feelings on it yeah. and their willingness to discuss. And so any singular issue, and with Amanda Palmer, we saw this with the question of whether or not she was paying her musicians, which was something that really sort of spiraled out of control and the message got a little bit lost, but she dealt with it beautifully by 
opening up the, the discussion. She was unafraid of people's opinions. And she said, listen, this is great. Let's talk this through. And at this point, um, it's a footnote. Right? So how do you... Um how do you work on releases that don't have the same amount of publicity as Amanda Palmer's? Mm -hmm. And, and how do you really, how do you deal with maybe a campaign that had a little bit of a harder time to, to get started and to, and to get going? Everything has got scale. I mean, the Amanda Palmer one blew up. Um, and we certainly didn't go in thinking that we were going to gross a million dollars. Um, there are smaller ones. We did a Kickstarter campaign for an artist called Cody Chestnut in the rest of the world. He was released on one little Indian which is a great label and he's got a history yeah. with it. His pedigree, his legacy in the US is self-releasing, but he needed some funds to do it. <clears throat> and he wanted to, to bring us in full service. He simply didn't have the cash flow for it. So we presented him with a Kickstarter campaign and we came up with a figure that, that he needed, which was $20,000 um, and put together a set of, <clears throat> of packages and bundles that we thought his fans would like yeah. and rolled it out. and. And we made it. it. It didn't blow the door off that goal. Um, I can't recall what where we ended, but it was just positive, just over 20,000. And it was a total success in terms of what we set out to do. Yeah. Um, and that was very effective. And what that did was it, it's effectively pre-sale. So what he, it's not that he didn't feel like he could afford it at the end of the day. It was just simply a cash flow issue. Yeah. So we set up a pre-sale. We used the Kickstarter platform to do that. And uh, the money came in that took care of some of the expenses that he had to self-release. And, and he's off to the races on his first U.S. tour. And in a segue to Kevin's interview, here's my chat with the CEO of uh, Pledge Music, Benji Rogers, explaining how the company works. Sure. Um, the concept of Pledge was that there was uh, a lot of crowdfunding companies in, in the space. Um, and there was a few when we launched it. And we really wanted to go in a different direction, more in the, in the uh, direct to fan direction i guess it would be and the concept really was that rather than say fund my album and then i'll go make it you would position it more as pledge here to be a part of the release of my new album and from day one you get access to a special part of the site that would have on it rough mixes live tracks demos video blogs and the reward for pledging is that you unlock this layer of you know um uh fan engagement um yeah. And that you could pledge in in multiple different ways, um, uh, and that a part of the profits could be given to a charity of the artist's choice. So what we saw was that whereas a crowdfunding campaign would last 30 or 60 days and then end, ours would continue from launch through till release of the yeah. record. And that meant that there was a lot more... Um, uh, you know, the artists would do better financially. Yeah. The fans would engage throughout the process, and someone would show up and give uh, money to a charity, which yeah. is, can't be bad. It's cool, <laughs> yeah, and it's cool to have the idea of it being a process rather than it being just a fixed deadline, and then after that, just being closed off. Right. The fixed deadline was always strange to me. Like, like you want to have some sort of gamification element. You want it to be like, and when we hit. 50%, 70%, 75%, 99%, something happens. But what we would do is is unlock more layers Stuff. of access rather than just say like, because fundamentally do music fans want to fund music or do they want to see behind the scenes stuff do they want to yeah. hear stuff before everybody else and we we built you know the means to deliver the, the digital content uh i hate that word deliver the digital music to the fans and we help the artists get um fulfill the uh physical stuff yeah and really what i viewed it was was that um we wanted to be the thinnest layer between fan and artist yeah. so the artist is comfortable and some of the social technology we built means that when the artist does a pledges only update which we call them pledges only updates uh it emails the fan directly it auto feeds the artist facebook and twitter yeah. but if i'm a fan and i've pledged that same update will feed my facebook and twitter oh, so great. each fan becomes like a, a sharing layer so if you were just to run a 30 or 60 day campaign that's not enough time to activate your entire fan base yeah so our campaigns will run three, four, five, six months, even sometimes a year. And as long as the artist delivers incredible music, videos, experiences, it doesn't get boring. Crowdfunding's brilliance lies in proof of concept. Yeah. If enough people want this watch, I'll build it. But music has a very different dynamic. And so 
when I look at um, traditional crowdfunding campaigns that go out, that often the price points aren't thought through very carefully. We vet those projects. We help them get the campaign to where it's going to succeed. Because yeah. my whole thing is, is that I don't want to have thousands and thousands of bands, you know, succeeding to this level. I want to have bands who have a, a better shot. And it's, you know, I never learned music business marketing when I was a musician. I could barely figure out how to tie my shoelaces. <laughs> so I needed a team to help me. And yeah. we've assembled a team of people who've run thousands of these campaigns now who go, you can't offer a signed CD and bake cookies for 10 bucks because if you have to send that to Japan, you've lost money which means that you're not going to be able to deliver your record, which means that there's, you know, it's a, it's a threat all the time. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, when we're working with the larger bands, you know, a band like, you know, we did the Ben Folds Five, you know, that was a f our first U.S. top 10 album. Um, you know, we were talking, you know, you know, tens of thousands of, 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 uh, of sales, and, and um, it was a logistical thing you know oh, there, there was a there was a big piece to that and getting getting cds into boxes was a was a challenge for them yeah. and and uh they did it and and it's it's you know it was a success but i think that we got to look at these things as how they can fit into the music industry and not be just a standalone you fund it and then it goes away because yeah. there's a, a you know, consequence to that this is going to become a normal way in which albums are released yeah and we're building ourselves into the fabric of a lot of not just labels but managers and uh, uh you know managers have used this three four and five times now yeah so it's becoming normal and when it becomes a normal part of the process the fans win because it involves maximum creativity to deliver these things so the artists are getting to be creative not just in the way that they make music but a marketing team now has this tool that gives them not just six weeks to work but four or five months you can roll out the greatest marketing campaign on earth and it pays for itself yeah what's not to win there you know so yeah my, my goal is is that this becomes a normal part of the conversation the second the band walks in the studio when they're being an artist not just a salesman when they're still an artist is when the campaign goes live yeah and it ends when it delivers to the stores. Yeah. That's my goal. Uh, and also, this goes in hand in hand with uh, the rise of uh, label services company, yep. uh, which is uh, really great for you guys because, of course, you know, label services company, which are not traditional labels that just yep. help the artists uh, deliver on, on their product and help mm. them in their path. And, of course, you guys become a part of the story in that. Yeah, it's been a phenomenal success uh, working with label services companies because what it's allowed our artists to do is come to the table with, with fully fledged finished product. And normally, what would happen is, when they would crowdfund it, they would then have to take it to label services and start again. Yeah. What the, the partnerships we're making with label services companies mean that we can launch these campaigns and the label services come in or are part of it from the word go. So your marketing doesn't begin when they, when they pick it up. It's already started. Yeah. And so if you look at it from a label or a, or a label services company's perspective, if we've already pre-sold a couple thousand records for the artists using, using the site, their job is made infinitely easier. They can go to radio and say, look at what's already happened. But I think that, that, that this will become the way in which music is released. Yeah. Fans will expect it, yeah. and they should, you know, um, because it's possible. Yeah. And streaming services took up a large portion of DMT's 2013 coverage. So here are a couple of interesting points made by the CEO of Deezer, Axel Dauché. And Deezer is uh, it's been, uh, relatively open on their, on their API front as well. Uh, uh, how, how, what's your take on, on third-party developers accessing uh, the API of Deezer or, or, or using uh, some of the information that comes from Deezer uh, for applications? It's crucial. You know, um, we decided to focus all our innovation and on our R&D to uh, the core service, which yeah. is provide the best music service. And so opening the API is, is really externalizing all the innovation worldwide. Yeah. For the past uh, 20 years, the music has been very uh, difficult to deal with for any kind of developers, yeah. country per country. Uh, it was very complex. And finally, those API allow to liberate, to unleash all the innovation worldwide. Yeah. Uh, you, whether you are a small developer or car manufacturers, to seamless access to 20 million tracks in 200 countries, it, it, it was a dream 
Yeah. In the past, you know, it's reality. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, talking about this, you know, of course, a uh, uh, huge round of funding last year. You know, big expansion plans internationally. Um, and a lot of people, of course, are you know talking about the U.S. and the car connected cars. But what's your vision for? Uh, these types of services like connected cars and, and, and things that maybe are a little bit more behind the curve in other countries. But how do you see them develop in, uh, in Europe and in other developing countries? So I think uh, we, we, we made that choice of, being, of trying to be global. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a hard choice. I mean, it was a choice with a lot of corresponding investments. Sure. We did it not only to catch the emerging market growth. Of course, for that, you know, yesterday the market is very concentrated in six markets. Now, yeah. Brazil, Turkey, Indonesia will become contributing for the good sake of everybody. Yeah. It's also because we believe that every, even tiny markets, it's at the same time a source of creation. And if you give access to those artists to the worldwide market, yeah. finally you are changing the charts and yeah. the consumption pattern, even in the existing big countries. Because so far, what you're listening in France, in the US, is mainly driven by the distribution structure, yeah. not by the creation and its match with the audience. So being global was a way for us to, to really break down the barrier for every creator to have access to the audience it deserves. How do you deal with uh, the challenge that is, of course, uh, the licensing side of music? Because uh, with the uh, international expansion comes uh, having to deal with the uh, collection societies in each territory, with uh, different publishers, different partners. And of course, uh, with so many territories, it becomes very difficult to have people on the ground on each territory. Uh, so how do you, uh, do you categorize different territories or, or manage to, to create an ecosystem where all those territories can be managed effectively, I guess? It, uh, there is a huge complexity, and yeah. so we spend a lot, a lot of nights to solve all those issues one by one. Um, um, uh, but that's you know when I when I'm in bad shape, I'm tired. When I'm in good shape, I'm saying, okay, I'm building an entry barrier to the next one. So, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you must be in a pretty unique position as well, because uh, once you do get to the, the number of countries that you hope to get to, you know, you're going to be one of, the, one of the companies with the most data on rights as well, which is interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm not sure we are yet there in terms of uh, understanding of the data, Yeah. but um, we made some partnership with universities about yeah. trying to find something, of course, some algorithm to identify the emerging tracks, uh, yeah. like the but also, which one I love, uh, how to measure the, uh, the transfer of uh, an artist from a country to another. Yes. And this virality, this uh, uh, geographic movement of a track of an artist, we learn a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, on-demand streaming uh, versus or with, together with uh, radio, uh, how do you see those two coexisting? Uh, can the you know and the curation of, for example, you know, uh, an automatic channel based on you know a certain artist uh, versus a purely on-demand offering? I think two kind of question and about the curation. Uh, we are very invested in curation. We have a 40 editorial head worldwide covering all the main cultural area. And uh, on those people, every day, every week are listening to 250 new albums yeah. and select the best of the best. So we think it's crucial to engage the people with music yeah. as uh, the non-algorithm based yeah. recommendation. You know? sure. uh, algorithm based recommendation puts you in clusters editor recommendation open your musical scope yeah so so it's important for us I don't think radio and smart radios are doing that job um, when you're on Pandora and you I mean select a, 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 a channel even very customized you will you will hear music you will go through music you don't know which is not discovery yeah Discovery is when you when you make an active things. So we, we consider they are not solving that issue. Second of all, there is a good uh, a complementarity between Andy Man and Radio because sometimes you need your music, sometimes you need some music. Yeah. So every user will switch from one to each other 
Uh, however, uh, I, I do consider that the, the Pandora model is uh, specific to the US. Absolutely. We'll leave it open to the other service. Sure. And uh, final question, talking about uh, how Radiza really broke into France uh, through its uh, partnerships with, uh, with some of the mobile carriers. Uh, how are you, are, you, are you planning to take that uh, similar strategy abroad? And is it very difficult to broker deals with, uh, with the mobile carriers? Uh, it's, it's absolutely uh, crucial for us. We are balancing a, rec a direct recruitment, leveraging Facebook and marketing investments with indirect recruitment through partners and specifically to carriers. Yeah. And uh, another thing, we need the carriers to be independent from Facebook and the Facebook to be independent from carriers. So we are trying to find the right balance between both. Um, uh, there is an incredible momentum for synergy with carriers. Yeah. We uh, already signed a, a carrier deal in 25 countries. Uh, wow. Including uh, including groups like uh, telco groups like Orange, Dutch Telecom, uh, Telenor, Melecom, Belgacom. You know we really succeed into replicating those deals. Yeah. Uh, but the hardest part starts when you sign the deal. Yeah. Because there is a huge difference between making the deal and making a success from the deal. So we learn how to train the sales force uh, to work on the sales force commission structure to make sure that this deal was become a real success behind. And as the last extract for today's show from my medium coverage, here's my interview with Chris Wilsey from Bandpage, talking about how the company changed course following the introduction of the Facebook timeline and its plans for the rest of 2013, which actually panned out pretty well considering that the company announced the data deals with the likes of Vivo and Xbox Music amongst others. In our particular case, uh, an API allowed us to to get into the market. Uh, you know, so in this case, it was a Facebook uh, API uh, that we built uh, the band page application uh, as a Facebook app. Um, and at that time, there was no easy way or elegant way for a band to market themselves on Facebook. So three years ago, they were still pointing to MySpace, even though the fans had all, for the most part, left. Yeah. Um, in that. Uh, in that instance, we, you know, our, our founders did a, a beautiful job on ex executing a, a really good app, and so uh, we just had a rocket uh, ride of a takeoff. And yeah. uh, so, on our second anniversary at South by Southwest, um, we, uh, I think, announced that it was maybe 175,000 bands, yeah. and then uh, I guess no, that was our first year. Sorry, our yeah. second year, we announced a half a million bands. Um, and so a real rocket ride. Um, one of the things we talked about in the in the panel, and there was a lot of interest about Bandpage because of um, because of the vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, uh, in in developing to a single platform, yeah, uh, it was sort of like a a devil's bargain, I suppose. You know, where we uh, had a tremendous opportunity, uh, and when we grew accordingly, and and it afforded us an amazing amount of scale in a short amount of time. Uh, and part of that was identifying a real need, executing well, and on a huge platform. Yeah. Um, but when Facebook changed directions uh, and, and ushered in the timeline, uh, ostensibly to, to improve the, the, uh, the site in terms of engagement and, yeah. and posting, uh, creating the ticker and uh, being able to create uh, many, many new types of advertising revenue, uh, all kinds of reasons why they, they made that change, uh, developers like us uh, took a back seat. Sure. And so, uh, for us, what that meant was uh, a big hit to the traffic. You know, yeah. we're still uh, on Facebook. We're still a top ten music app on Facebook, but uh, the traffic levels are significantly reduced. Yeah. Um, and so we talked on the panel about, um, you know. Uh, dependencies, um, how to control and minimize risk, how companies work together, uh, what are some optimal arrangements, that kind of thing. I think to to do it again, would we do it any different? I honestly don't think we would do it any different. Uh, would It would have been better uh, if we had been ready uh, to roll out our next sets of tools, tools right away, uh, yeah. because we were frankly uh, well down the path of, of developing our own APIs so that we could uh, get 
the band page into other platforms sure. and, and share the band page uh, across the web and mobile. Um, but the timeline shift uh, essentially caught us before we were ready. Yeah. Uh, it takes yeah. a while to develop these things, uh, and we really were committed to quality, uh, the same quality for the bands that we serve um, that we had on Facebook, which frankly, quality, I think, is what allowed us to be so successful there. Yeah. We had the, the most elegant app, and that's why Beyonce and Kanye West and a bunch of top artists have used Bandpage. Um, we wanted to have that same set of tools. So the the same, I guess, uh, vulnerability that you know that that hurt us when the timeline came out uh is is uh you know the api is also what is is uh saving band page yeah, and so when sure. we think about where we're headed uh it is an api driven strategy um, and moving on from Cannes in january to austin in march dmt did a lot of work at southwest southwest and we start this short summary with a segment recorded with vicky norman the president of north america at seven digital and of course it's not just a question of um getting you know the catalog that you already have to those markets it's also a question of licensing their catalog for for your service so that's where it really starts to get tricky because uh, i've had some dealings with you know having to deal with some writers from mexico and having to call their collection site and it, it was it was pretty hard to do so do you guys have people on the ground that do that well we we're we're somewhat masochists in this because it, it's so difficult because in each territory every time you want to expand internationally you have uh, the labels, you have the publishers, there's usually some sort of collection society representing the publishers. So you have to do direct deals with all of them. Yeah. And then in addition to that, there's usually really important market forces at play. So is it carriers? Is it, you know, who are the gating items? What kind of devices do people use? Do they have connectivity in their homes or is it in the workplace? What, you know, and if we're, if you're trying to license a la carte downloads, mm -hmm but the market, the price of a download is equal to dinner for a family of four for a week, then it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. So we have to look at all of those factors and figure out what the right model is, when the time is right to go into it, and ways to have enough local connections on the ground to get the right catalog, the locally relevant catalog, and build the relationships. One of the big things for the company has been uh, the API, uh, you know, you operate mostly uh, a lot on a, on a B2B basis uh, with company using the API to offer offer your catalog out. Uh, so, uh, you know, the numbers are, are great, you know, 137% uh, increase year over year and 13.5k uh, uh, API requests per minute, uh, which is uh, which is great. And so, you know, there are, two, there are two sides to this. On the one side, you have the big partners, uh, like the pure of this world and, you know, uh, uh, Samsung and, and, and all that side and then you have the smaller companies so on the smaller company side how do you of course it takes a lot of like work to, to, to do these deals and to, to get them together uh, but it's uh, do you find that there's a, a great response from them because of course otherwise it's almost impossible for them to get the catalog that they need it is it is and it's it's a it, it, you know the the big companies are great because they have distribution they have growth they have reach into every home across the world but the startups and the small companies are really significant to us because they use the API in ways that the big companies will never do because they're very creative, very innovative, and they will help, the API is open, yeah. so they'll help expand all of the functionality for everyone. But the other thing that's really important about the smaller companies and the startups is that they, you know, they need, a, they need a, an active pool of music to work with, and so, but it's a chicken and the egg because they have an idea and they want to build something, yeah. but they don't know what rights they need and they can't get the rights, they can't get a catalog unless they have cleared the rights. So we've done a couple of things, like we created this prototype package that gives developers three months to do whatever they want with our catalog. It's for prototype and beta only. And that gives them an active pool of music and live music to be able to demonstrate what they're trying to build. And sometimes, Sometimes that's really, you know, like they have to have access to the music in order to to really get across the power of their application. You know, yeah. PowerPoint or a pitch just doesn't quite do it. And one of the challenges I think that is going to be faced by any service that works in music uh, at this point uh, is going to be a, a one of cross cross compatibility. I mean, of course, nobody's even thinking about this right now. Uh, so you know, there's no way that you can port things from Spotify to Deezer to Audio. But, you know, playlist portability and uh, metadata portability, 
uh, cross compatibility of links as well. Like, you know, if a friend of yours is not on the same service, are a big, big issue. Do you think there's, there's a chance that at some point in the future uh, there's, there's going to be some resolution to that? Well, I think there's, I, I would like to think that there, there would be. Um, but I think there's a couple of issues that are really that are really big underlying issues in our industry. One is there's no single identifier for a song, so you know this seems this seems really strange because you know each you know each computer has a unique identifier, but we can't seem to come up with that for music. That's difficult. But there are some companies trying to solve that problem, and we're one of them in there. And um, and you know services that are gated off strictly by a subscription. They have, you know, of course they don't want their playlist to be portable to another service that's gated off by subscription because those things are mutually exclusive. Um, but again, we see a, a value in focusing on the user and focusing on the user experience. And what we know about music lovers is that they want a variety of sources. They want programmed music, they want their own well, they want to own their own collection and maybe they want to subscribe to yeah. something. And we see value in trying to keep the music that they love relevant across all of those types of services. And we continue the South by Southwest coverage with the president of City Baby, Brian Felsen. You know, but City Baby has been one of the sort of pioneering platforms for distribution of music, uh, and you work in the physical and the digital market. Of course a lot of people uh, just think think of you as a digital distribution service, but you also have a strong uh, and, and healthy uh, CD distribution service. Yeah. Uh, so how has that been evolving in the past uh, you know, two or three years uh, in the balance between the physical and the, and the digital? Uh, it's been evolving in interesting ways because the digital, the physical CDs had been in decline for a while. So we have been doing all kinds of things such as sending to more streaming services, uh, doing deals with uh, different territories, with cell phone carriers, uh, sync licensing things, uh, getting people paid for YouTube. Uh, foreign royalty collection, but the strangest thing happened is that over the last year, year over year, our physical sales are up 25%. So that's something we never expected. And looking back on it, we can tell it's because of our deal with Alliance and because of our better algorithms and relationships with Amazon and people like Best Buy and Target and things like that. But we just did not expect that kind of a turnaround. Of course. You know, now there's just, uh, hundreds of different digital services. There's just so many. And it's, it's kind of, a, I guess, it's a, it's a hard choice to, to understand really cool. You have to concentrate on. Uh, you know, a company's time is not limitless, so you have to dedicate resources to the services that you think are going to be, you know, bringing money to your artists, of course. Uh, so, w what's your take on that? And you know, and also internationally, how do you see services that m maybe not be on the radar for us in in, in the in the US or in the UK? Um, well, we it's there's always a balance, right? I mean, I go to to festivals all over the world, just got back from Medem and just trying to find new territories and new services that have an interesting model that can make money for their artists. Some of them, which I know will not be in existence six months from now, I just won't do the deal. And some, you know, other companies will, and then they'll spend their resources and then the company will go under. Or some of it, the artists just make so little money, it's almost detrimental. But we found a way just from looking at, at companies overseas and people like Bloom and Yandex and all these new markets and things that we've been able to grow the streaming services in the foreign territories but still have our download sales and uh, and our physical sales go up so our point is to not cannibalize any of the more traditional venues yeah, sure. and uh, you know the backhand side of a service like yours uh, must have become really difficult to deal with in the last five or uh, four or five years uh, with all the streaming services coming into play uh, so and of course, a service that has hundreds of thousands, of, you know, of, of tracks, uh, it's it's even more difficult. So, uh, how, how do you build that part of it up? And was it was it tricky to find a to find the right way to really uh, account for and report on, on the streaming royalties? Yes, yes. Uh, the short is is that we screwed it up royally. Uh, there's really, we were going along merrily. We had a couple hundred thousand uh, um, artists and um, it, it, what happened was we, we were growing uh, faster than we had projected and then we did a deal with Spotify and Spotify literally broke our accounting. It was like suddenly we had millions of lines of incoming stream going to uh, four decimal places after the penny 
and it was like it was total like all nighters all weekends just trying to be able to account for it all and you know now we have we have it we have probably the most robust accounting system in the industry we handle almost five million tracks um, and millions and millions of lines of streaming data which we can display every single one for our dozens of partners but man it wasn't easy <laughs> Um, looking at services like iTunes, of course, uh, it's still got huge, uh, you know, influence in the sales uh, and in the industry in general. Uh, how are your relationships with? How's your relationship with iTunes? And uh, you know, I, I myself used to work at, at a label, and it was very, very difficult to actually get hold of them and talk to them and, and get them to do anything. So, did, did, has that improved uh, on the customer service side? Uh, I mean, our relationship with iTunes is unparalleled. In fact, we're going to dinner tonight again. <laughs> we, uh, I'm in Cupertino all the time. There, we have um, the thing is not only do we give them the largest chunk of their catalog, um, but we also have the cleanest data and metadata, which makes them very happy. So we have a direct connect relationship, which gets us our artists live within 48 or even 24 hours. So we just they audit us, and we you know they keep saying, okay, are there any tickets? Are there any problems with the audio? Problems with the metadata? But we were number one among our peers in terms of the quality of our delivery. That's great. And, and, and do you feel like they're being uh, relatively open when it comes to featuring artists as well? iTunes is going to feature who they're going to feature. So we can push artists to them. But the fact of it is, is that if you win America, America's Got Talent or something like that, you're going to be featured. And for us, if there's an interesting story of an artist touring or that has a big bump in sales velocity or something, they'll feature it. And we let them know who we think is really good and who's up and coming. But they're going to do what they're going to do. They've got such a huge platform. And it's, you know, we can't, we can't just dictate who they're going to push. Of course. And do you feel like streaming services as well? Uh, you know, I know quite a few of them have you know, the aspiration to demonstrate that they can break artists as well. So do, do, do you find that they maybe uh, they are really looking for stories and looking for artists that they want to champion and push? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's ones uh, like even Rhapsody, which was the first, uh, is looking with their deal for uh, with Metro PCS uh, to push uh, musics and genres for that demographic. So they're, they're they're very interested in playlists. And Beats is coming out with which is uh, with their new service, and they're talking about curation. So they are interested, but not just breaking artists. These streaming services have a, another challenge, which is simply to break even. So it'll be very interesting to see how that all works out in the next couple of years. Sure. Following on from Brian, here's my chat with Theda Sandiford, the VP of Digital Marketing at Universal Republic Records, and here we chat mostly about mobile. And um, taking a, a look at the, at the landscape for digital marketing, of course, uh, we're seeing uh, some huge numbers from, from some companies like, for example, uh, Pandora was talking about how 75% of the listening hours are on mobile and their mobile advertising unit is doing re surprisingly really well. Uh, you know, RDO has revealed, you know, I think 80% of the listeners are on mobile. And so um, how does the marketing play stand for labels uh, when it comes to mobile? Because, of course, you know, three or four years ago, Everybody was talking about artist-specific apps, and, and they still are in a sense, but we're, we're not seeing uh, as big of a push or as many releases anymore as, as, as I would have thought. So how is that working? Okay, well, one thing is I personally hate artist vanity apps. Yeah. Um, they, when that was the trend, the trend was we're going to offer something exclusive through this mobile app. Well, they never offered anything exclusive through the mobile app. It was always more of what you can get on Twitter or Facebook or on the uh, artist uh, webpage. Yeah. Um, so I don't think the the experience of that exclusive sort of mobile thing. The only thing you get for it really is the push messaging yeah. on the mobile phone, and honestly, that's not enough of, of a reason to have a mobile app. The other reason why artist vanity mobile apps are, are I believe, are a mistake is that um, you have to market and sell that app. Um, once it's in the app store, if you're not in the top 20 or the second page of people looking through free apps, no one's finding you and they're not looking for you. Um, and if you're not ranked there, you don't really exist. Um, and the core business of a record company is to sell music. So the same amount of energy, effort, um, and marketing yeah. has to go into selling these apps, which you then can't sell music to, to yeah. um, uh, as you would sell a music product. So uh, either download, stream, or, or, or some sort of view you're driving on YouTube. Yeah. So it, it, uh, right now, it just doesn't scale, and yeah. it doesn't make sense. 
I've switched uh, every artist that says I want a mobile app. I said, great, go build it on yourself. Go ahead, and and here's and here's my recommendation how you would want to market it. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna make our money doing what we know t- uh, that we could sell. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so all our artist sites are now mobile optimized sites. So I find more people are searching on the phone looking for something, and all the data I see shows that uh, the mobile uh, uh, the mobile search and uh, people coming to the artist websites from their phones is greater than ever before. At least. Uh, at least averaging anywhere from 30 to 70 percent, um, depending on the artists and the genre, um, are coming from, from, from mobile. They're not sitting so there doing no it. No flash. No, no, no <laughs> flash and, and limited on HTML5, yeah. but really, you know, building off, building a, off a platform that has responsive design that's really looking at. Um, yeah. Um, looking at how people across the board um, less time spending uh, testing various browsers more time focused on people's consumption patterns on mobiles and tablets. So how do you see the role of radio, traditional radio changing uh, in a campaign to break an act? I mean uh, in the UK I was in a a few panels where where, uh, you know people uh, kept talking about how radio is something that shouldn't be important anymore in theory because of the internet, but it's actually I mean, the most important you thing. One radio station. Yeah, and it's and it's still incredibly important to break an artist. Yeah, um, how's the situation in the U.S.? Well, I mean, we have multiple formats and tens of thousands of radio stations. So, um, you know, a band like of Monsters and Men, uh, which broke out of South by Southwest last year. Uh, started in one format and is that same song Little Talks is just now crossing to top 40 a year later so I I think I I can only speak from the United States perspective because of the the proliferation of all the different um, uh, genres of radio stations and the time it takes from one song to move from one genre, from alternative, triple A to alternative, to rock, to top 40, that can take 18 months to pass through that entire cycle. Wow. Um, I've noticed with apps like iHeartRadio, Last FM for, for CBS, and um, uh, I believe, uh, well, I'll just talk about those two, because those are probably the two biggest change, CBS and uh, Clear sure. Channel. They are doing interesting things with their with their mobile uh, radio apps. They they have developing artist programs. Yeah. They're doing things within their apps where they will play music that they haven't even added to the radio station yet to warm it up to see what data they get back. Are people requesting it? If they play yeah. that song after another song, and how, through the mobile app, um, what is the reaction? Are people skipping? Are they staying around longer? Uh, and they're using this data so that they then take to their terrestrial radio stations um, and, and kind of inform some of the, the programming decision process. That's so, awesome. So it's almost like A-B testing. Like that I think so. Yeah, ages, and it's really awesome that they're getting there and are starting to do that. So um, they also recognize that... Um, uh, their local radio station is a local resource, yep. whereas uh, since so much of the programming is on a nationalized basis, national chains, syndicated programs coming in, that the local, the local flavor of that radio station is really reflected on the website. Yep. Sure. Um, so I, you see that there are there's content and effort to create content when the artist is up at the radio station that can live on in an archive type environment uh, on the local uh, radio station website. So all that's very encouraging. Yeah. Yeah, uh, now, one thing I don't think most radio stations do very well, terrestrial stations, is they don't do social well. Um, they're a traditional broadcast medium. I'm talking at you. And social is a conversation. And so when you look on their Facebook pages, you notice that there's very low talks about, which is an indication that there's low engagement on the page. Yeah. And that's something they could be doing a lot better job. It's not just, I shot this great video and interview with the artist when they were in this, up at the station. It's what other content can you build around that piece of media 
that is more engaging as a conversation with the audience. And when radio stations learn how to do that, they will definitely be in a much better position socially competing against Pandora's and Spotify's and RDO's and Deezer's and all of those type of applications. Yeah, of course. And uh, Cristelia Garcia from the George Washington Law School talks about termination rights in the U.S. One of the, one of the f- first things that you know you mentioned when we started emailing was the, the issue of termination termination rights and, and, and how that is evolving in the United States, so of course, because uh, uh, you know that's where the, a lot of the conversations are taking place. Uh, so just tell me a little bit, a bit about you know generally about what, what's the situation in, in the states uh, in regards to that. Sure. Uh, yeah, termination rights are, are a real hot topic right now, primarily uh, because they this is the first time January 2013 that artists are really able to make a claim for those rights. Um, termination rights are also a big deal because of the potential consequences they have for uh, record labels uh, and publishing companies and for the possible uh, gains that they present for artists. So termination rights came about um, with the 1976 Copyright Act and basically it was Congress's way of recognizing a disparity between the bargaining power in artists and uh, intermediaries like record labels and music publishers. Um, in other words, uh, you know, the Beach Boys didn't know that they were going to be the Beach Boys and so they may have taken deal um, on less favorable terms. This termination rights kind of gives them a second bite at the apple, if you will, um, by allowing them to, 35 years later, come back and say, okay, we want our rights back, and they can renegotiate deals with better terms, they can take their masters and do with them what they will, they can sell them on their own. So this is kind of what the thing is, and you know, the consequences of that for record labels, although as consumers we often focus on new and upcoming artists and new releases, um, catalog, which is what we call like everything that's not a new release, um, is really, for most major record labels, upwards of 70% of their revenue. So this is a big deal if they were to start losing out on these things. Um, uh, it's not as simple as all that, and I'm sure there's lots of tricks of on both sides for you know attorneys to, to prevent this from happening, but uh, that's kind of the gist of termination rights. And the reason they're becoming a big deal now, like I said, is because this is the first time that we're actually being able to see people claiming them, and it remains to be seen how successful they are, and if they are successful, what that will mean for uh, contracts going forward. Absolutely. And, uh, Looking at, for example, uh, you know, the, the issue of like, the length of copyright, for example, it's something that every time we come up to the deadline of the copyright, it seems like it's getting extended. So what's the deal on, on, on the legislative side of things uh, for termination rights? And uh, have there been proposals, uh, of course, probably lobbied by you know, uh, record labels to extend uh, what was uh, the term de- deemed from, from that? Um, so the, the the statutory uh, time on termination rights, as I mentioned, is 35 years. Um, that is currently not up for debate, and there aren't any bills that I know of to extend that time. Instead, what intermediary copyright holders like record labels are, are going to do is fight termination rights on a couple of other legal bases. Yeah. One that's probably the most popular that's sort of started now is work for hire, which is just legalese for an employee-employer relationship. Yeah. The termination rights clause in the Copyright uh, Act uh, excludes work for hire from being able to exercise ter- termination rights. So if a copyright holder like a record label can show that in fact the musician was an employee in a work for hire situation, they are excluded from termination rights and they won't be able to exercise them. So if they can pull that off and make that argument, that would that would be convenient. Of course, the trick is most musicians aren't employees, right? They're, if anything, more like contractors or freelance workers. They generally don't enjoy a salary or health benefits. Um, so it'll be a little tricky to prove this. Not that record labels haven't tried by actually putting work for higher language in the contracts, um, but the fortunate thing for some artists is that the way that the termination rights section of the statute is drafted says that even if you claim it's a work for hire, the courts can disregard that if they don't think it really is. So, remains to be seen. We really need a test case. We need someone to press for their rights and um, be sued by the labels or, or have the labels resist and then be sued so that we can see what courts are actually going to do with it. It's so early yet we don't have that. And, um, you know, right now we do have people like the Eagles and the Beach Boys, for example, who have filed for their termination rights, but we have labels who have not responded, just radio silence. So we're, we're, we're all kind of, uh, you know, the copyright nerds among us are excited to see if there will be a response and if If not, will they just peacefully let it go? Will they resist? And then will there be lawsuits? Unfortunately, I think we need a test case to know what to do with these. 
This year on DMT we covered Songza a lot, although the company still has quite a bit of ground to cover in order to catch up to competitors like Pandora. And here is my chat with one of the founders, Eric Davish. So we've, uh, it's actually, Songza is very new to most people, but we've been a company um, since 2006. We started as a digital download store called Amy Street, where we sold MP3s dynamically priced. So based on, you know, um, when, you, when you came to Amy Street, every song started for free and increased in price the more that it was purchased. There was a social element, there was a gaming element. Yeah. And we had a nice little user base, very engaged people, big music fans, a lot of independent artists getting their music discovered. And we had a nice platform. We, um, but, you know, in our own personal lives, we were using streaming to discover music. And we found that it was really frictionless, easy way to share music. Yeah. easy way to listen and sample so we started experimenting with songza um, and so for a while we were doing both amy street and songza and yeah. when we started songza originally there were, it was a much different product we tried many different things with songza and ultimately we saw a much bigger future with the streaming space and with songza yeah. and so decided that we wanted to do that full time so we sold the amy street brand to Amazon, who's an investor in us since 2007, and concentrated on songs of full time starting in 2010. Yeah. And the songs of product involved several several times throughout those from 2010 to 2012, starting as a social radio service in which we would curate playlists and encourage people to add songs with a similar theme. Yeah. Um, but we we found that it was hard to regulate the songs that the community would add to a thematic playlist and it would it would you know the theme would get lost so we started curating we closed off playlists and started curating a bit more um you know more thematic playlists and and we eventually started doing thematic playlists that were based on lifestyle so you know in our own lives we were noticing that we listen to music while we're doing other things we're listening to music while we're working out while we're working and it served as a way to make our to enhance our mood to make what we were doing go by faster to be better to be more enjoyable so um, we decided to build out an expertly curated playlist library based on genres moods decades activities cultural events and this thing called record store clerk and we in 2011 had come out with the first version of the songs of mobile application which is pretty much our library of playlists that you could browse through and so you could browse by activity to find workout playlists and then browse through dozens of workout playlists to find the perfect one problem with that was that it's a little bit too difficult a little too labor intensive a little too men mental math heavy so that required thought it required um you know work it, it took you know 30 seconds or so to find the perfect playlist, if not more. So we decided after showing it to a lot of people, after you know getting some really great feedback, that we wanted to shorten the process of getting you to the perfect playlist. And instead of making you search for it or find it yourself, we wanted to be able to, to deliver it to you. And in our own anecdotal experience, we were able to deliver people a perfect playlist when we showed it to them in person in about two steps. And so we aimed to simulate that experience with the concierge and that's sort of how that came about we debuted that about a year ago um, first on the web then on iPhone uh, Android um, and on tablets for both of those platforms and when we debuted our iPad app in June of last year we um, got featured on the front page of the iTunes app store went to number one on their charts downloaded um, got 1.15 million installations on iOS platforms alone uh, in a week. So um, you know that was that was when people really started to pay attention to us, and that's when people really started to acknowledge our existence. It's great to hear when people you know that people love songs, but what we you know, we're so focused on improving the product always that you know anyone who tells me that that they love songs, I I will ask them. You know, what can we do to make it better? You know, what do you not like about songs? Uh, it's part of our DNA is to, you know, question all our assumptions that we've made um, 
you know, all the punches that we've had, um, all the, you know, all the features that we've got, all the potential features that we could make, you know, what can we do to make that even better? Because, you know, we're going to need to, you know, there's a lot, there's a long way for us to go. You'd be surprised, you know, people think that songs is perfect, but there's a lot that we can do to make songs better, and there's a lot that we have planned that's going to really, um, you know, really surprise and delight you um, as you continue to use the service. And so we want to make sure that we're always ahead of that, um, always innovating and always thinking creatively in that respect. And as the final extract from my South by Southwest coverage, here's a chat with Katie McMahon from music recognition service Soundhound. Uh, with international expansion, uh, come and you know more and more stores being added to the, to the App Store by Apple and uh, more and more countries. Uh, it comes like a challenge in the in the tagging of, of the music as well. So, how have you managed sort of the growth of the database and, and, and the ingestion yeah. of international uh, catalog as well? Yeah, and, and that's really important because while you need to have the, the massive hits, it's important in in regional markets to likewise make sure you have local databases and and we work across um, every platform of major labels independents and we have we have artists coming to us directly saying please ingest my albums or my collection because I know if fans are, are trying to sound hound and, and you want to give them that result yeah. so it's a big part of our effort to continuously grow our database also the other thing that we're heavily focused on is our live lyrics um, database if you will having songs the lyrics but making those live lyric eyes so that's a sound hound feature where literally if I ID a song if I'm standing in the coffee shop the song information comes the beautiful graphic but it, that song's lyrics are moving in sync with the song at the moment in time yeah. and that is just a, a re-emergence of the of the love for lyrics yeah yeah sure and do you guys power that service yourself or do you have a third no no that, that's that's a wholly owned and created in-house technology from soundhound inc so to be able to continually take songs and make sure that the lyrics aren't static but they're li live lyrics that likewise is part of a, a growth internally in our in our back end database that the team of, of engineers are set across. And the same the same thing on the licensing side, right? You, you license the, the right. track itself. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, and you're talking about uh, London and, and, and maps are, are a big thing as well for Soundhound. So you've uh, recently partnered with Audio to offer uh, a, you know a second you know a, a yeah. sort of a mapping experience for for your users that would allow them to work out what what, what tracks have been played where. Exactly. And, and this is something that you know aside from just audio is something that. It really taps into the data that you collect on Absolutely. what's been tagged, uh, where, and, and when. Uh, so, what do you what, what do you think is the evolution evolutionary step in the use of this data? And uh, do you think you can make the most of it as, as an individual company, or do you think you're gonna open up so yeah, something yeah. in order to 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 get more companies to come in and, and make really amazing stuff with it? Well, you're hitting on the topic of data and what Soundhound sits on in terms of how much information we know. Um, across music taste, yeah. what time, where, when, what people are are using identification for, um, and and that opens up a wealth, a treasure trove of insight. Yeah. Could it be very valuable to record labels to understand where do I put my um, A and R dollars? What artist is going to really break through? Yeah. And I'll tell you, inside of yeah, in Soundhound, we have you know the hottest chart and the most tweeted chart, but we also have something called Soundhound Discoveries, and yeah. that's one of our charts, which we do this thing where we're, we're trying to wait how much a song gets radio played and discount that in order to bubble up songs that are, for some reason, really risk getting, getting a response. Again, no one is holding a gun to someone's head to say, go ID this. But for some reason, someone's pulling out their device, capturing that song. It could be a song that's be being played on an audio um, on a TV commercial. It could yeah. be a, a song from the 80s that has a re-emergence and we can see that trend happen. right? So that's an example of where um, data is incredibly interesting. Yeah. But back to bubbling it up to the end user to really enjoy and, and dive into. Um, but I should mention that on Soundhound Discoveries, we, we're already predicting who will win the Grammys in two years' time. You know, wow. Three years back, we saw Lady Annabelle and bubble up. Two years ago, we saw Mumford & Sons bubbling up. And it, it's almost this lag time that then suddenly, boom, the Grammys is, is right there. Yeah. But to the point of um, the maps feature, why this is so fun is we've always wanted to bring out exactly this experience where really it, it's music voyeurism. Yeah. Who's listening to what, where? 
and all you need to do is tap on it, open up that map, zoom, 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 and drill down literally to, to, to this town in Austin. We can see what it's getting I, I, ID'd right then and there. Yeah. It's really a fun, engaging, I can play it, I can listen to it, I can shrink the map, flip over to London and see what's getting sound hunted there. And right. it, it's, it's music voyeurism for anybody that wants to discover new music or just learn what's getting played in, in Sao Paulo. It, yeah. it can be a total random moment, mindless at times, or a real lean in of like, let me, let me find some track that I otherwise never would have come across. Yeah. And from Austin, Texas to Mannheim in Germany, I went to the Future Music Campo once again. I love the pop academy down there. And here's an extract with uh, my chat with Ulysses Hupauf from the management company Odyssey Music Network. So some of the, one of the things that we talked about on the show quite a bit is the ch evolving role of management and management becoming a hub for the artist, uh, uh, providing a lot of services that maybe labels are not willing or able to provide anymore. Also, as certain things become more relevant, like social media and uh, you know um, direct fan. And that kind of stuff. Uh, so how, how do you, how do you take that that and uh, how can you evolve as management to to be able to serve all these things without going crazy basically because you know it's a lot it's a lot of things to take care of. Well, I think that management completely changed in the last 10 years uh, from being the spokesperson for a band and the label will do the decision and delivers all the service to basically the center of making the decisions and sometimes you know even need to fund findings for uh, fundings for it and um, run campaigns and have a master plan there while no one else would develop one so yeah. all of a sudden i think management is in the role that um, they have to they have to create artist careers find the right people for it and not rely on any of the others to do so but do it yourself yeah and what, what do you think uh, another type of company that's sort of sp springing up in the last few years which is uh, taking a good uh, an important role a specialist management has to off offlay some of their their responsibility as well is labor relations services as well which uh, can manage anything from uh, you know a pledge campaign to uh, you know to take on some of the sort of load of uh, of uh, managers for example so do you think that's a useful tool for for you or would you rather it be more centralized mm, well in one way, I think that's exactly what we offer. We, ha we have, you know, uh, everything built around artist management, but then we offer label services okay. to release records and market those records. We do that with other independent artists, which we don't represent the management. We do it for international labels, for GSA or for mainland Europe. Um, we have a consulting unit where we have things like Pledge, while we just meet here. Um, we represent Pledge, do a lot of work for Pledge, which helps our artists as well. Um, we have a publishing unit, which works with Universal, which, you know, Know, delivers a lot of the publishing assets to it. So we have a, a, um, a producer management side of things where we have access to studios and producers for it. So th that's ex kind of exactly the system and idea what we're having. Yeah, yeah of course. And uh, looking at the sort of German music music scene, um, of course, if you look at the stats in Germany, physical is still very, very important. And so, uh, uh, but that's uh, in a way a, a little bit problematic, especially if you have a campaign where you want to that you want to bring more independently and without you know the aids of of, of major labels and so uh, what are the tools here in germany for for an independent artist for example to distribute a physical record in an effective way that so that they can still make money of it true on one hand very luckily physical is very strong still yeah. in germany there's a great infrastructure on distribution and especially on on um, shops to sell music um, we have a good infrastructure of independent distribution companies. Um, major distribution companies also opened up more for indies to come in to do distribution for them. So the old saying that the major record label controls distribution, it's not true anymore. We, we see more and more that big independent artists go with independent distribution and ha are as successful, sometimes even su more successful than they were when they were with, with uh, majors. But they play a role. And the majors play a role there because the distribution systems they have are very, very strong and valid. And also in Mannheim, in my first uh, Top Gear style interview from a car, as I interview Peter Bergner about the latest developments in dashboard technology at BMW. And so, uh, in terms of connectivity, um, how are you finding the experience uh, of streaming? Because, of course, you know, one of the big worries that people have when, when you talk about streaming music in the car is the fact that you're not going to have connection all the time. So, uh, how, is, how, how is that side of it? How, how are you working on that? 
Yeah. So we try to optimize it as best as we can. So obviously, if you have no internet connection at all, um, then you just can yeah. listen what you've downloaded before. Um, right now, this is TuneIn. Um, so in TuneIn, we have a functionality called Time Shift. So we could uh, simply skip back a title and listen to that title again. So if we have no reception, for example. Um, if we use other applications like Pandora in the US or OPO, um, in those radio-ish applications, um, we try to catch uh, songs ahead. So even when you are in a bad, uh, in an area with poor reception, you still have access to your great music. That's awesome, and, and so there's a, there's a little, little bit of caching as well involved, I guess, whilst your yeah. whilst the music is playing. So if you go through a tunnel, you still have those 10 seconds ahead that you can keep listening, and then it will catch up when when it reconnects. Yes, exactly. Even though tunnels are interesting because tunnels are typically where you have the best reception, because people <laughs> want to want to be able to make phone calls there. So yeah. in tunnels, you'll always have great receptions. While reception while FM typically doesn't work. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so uh, you know, looking at how this field is evolving uh, of course the biggest challenge that uh, I hear from people that, that work in the car space is that uh, cars are designed a long time ahead and so uh, you know the, the biggest problem that manufacturers have is that technology moves so quickly that the worry is that if you design a system then it's going to be four years old by the time you take it to market so how do you how do you manage to avoid that yep. so what we did is we created that generic interface called BMW apps uh, which you find in the connected drive menu um, and you can uh, enable any any application on the phone to connect to that interface um, so like this we can retrofit new functionality even to old cars so for example we we launched this interface in mini already in 2010 and the new applications which we just announced like tune in rhapsody they work seamlessly also in those models and moving on from Mannheim to Washington DC, it was the turn of the World Creator Summit organized by CZAC. And in that respect, I gotta start with a segment recorded with French music legend and the new CZAC president, Jean-Michel Jarre. You're a, a, a pioneer of uh, uh, electronic music. Uh, of course, you use technology uh, from the very early stages uh, as, a, as a tool. And uh, a lot of the conversation that I heard today uh, uh, from, from, the, from the creators is that uh, uh, Technology has to be seen as a tool, and it can be a positive one. Uh, but uh, you know, there is still a little bit of friction between the technology industry and, and the creative industries, at least as far as I've seen in the last couple of days. So, how, how do you think that can be uh, uh, smoothed out? Actually, I always, in my in my own career, I always had to fight against the system using new technology. Yeah. When I started as a music as an, a musician as in electronic music, we're just a bunch of considered as a bunch of crazy guys doing crazy sounds on cra on, on odd and weird instruments. Yeah. And actually, my first album, like uh, Oxygen, has been re refused and rejected by almost by all record companies at that time. So, I think I have a kind of experience of fighting and dealing with new technology, yeah. and uh, I can say that. Generation after generation, we always have to, to uh, uh, we, are, we always have two, uh, two attitude. One is to be scared. And it's always happened when television happened. The world of cinema said, "Okay, this is the end of it," and it was the reverse. When uh, uh, the when the uh, recording industry started, all the publishers and the publishing world said. This is the end of it. We were we had the monopole of rights, and now it's the the guy. They are the guys. I mean, manufacturing vinyls and records and so on and so forth. Who are going to to steal from us? And then it didn't really happen because, I mean, they had to adapt themselves to the new system. I think it's the same thing with internet. We have to find a way uh, to uh, uh, to deal with the new. Rule and with the new uh, with the new um, instruments. Actually, you have to. I think the, the, the I think it's not very positive to try to uh, oppose and to, to create an opposition between uh, artists who could be a kind of victims and complaining. It's not what we are anyway. Uh, uh, the world is not waiting of having. It's not the image of artists. Sure. The, and 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 so we have to. 
okay, to, to uh, uh, backstage to discuss exactly what what we want, and then conveying one clear and message, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, clear and precise message. And on the other hand, I mean, if you think about Google and YouTube, it has been created by young kids 15 years ago. Yeah. All these giants of the internet even didn't existing didn't, didn't existed 15 years ago, and those kids suddenly who created that. I mean, they they created fa a fantastic tool, but they had no idea that 15 years later they could be considered as devils. They may become devils, but it's a, but they still have a chance, maybe. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> and, 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 and this opportunity for us is to, to find a way. They need us, and you need, and we need them. So, th so, but it's a matter of vocabulary, grammar, and communication, and education. And also, we must we must also uh, promote what we are talking about to the public opinion. Yeah. People in the street don't understand what we are talking about. It's our responsibility to make our message clear. And at the moment, I mean, people don't, don't even know what uh, CISAC is, what yeah, uh, sure. PRS, what uh, ASC, ASCAP, all these acronyms are very abstract. So there is a big confusion. And obviously, uh, and also, it's absolutely unfair and, and, and untrue to consider that manufacturer, manufacturer of electronic products would symbolize the future and artists and creators would symbolize a kind of old-fashioned world uh, with uh, rich kids sat on their pot of gold, pots of gold. I think this has to be restored. We have been the outsiders as artists and creators, questioning and shaking the trees and, and questioning societies. We, we must, we must uh, restore this image and having an image more exciting, more glamorous that we always, artists always had and, and, and finding, finding the, 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 the appropriate uh, uh, economy, uh, economical eco ecosystem, economic system. And it was a bit of a coup to get the US's Register of Copyrights, Maria Palante, on the show. I hadn't had any heavyweight politicians from Washington on the show as of yet, so let's hear what she had to say. Uh, what is the role of the, of the Copyright Office uh, as part of the US government? So the US Copyright Office is part of the Library of Congress, and we, uh, since 1870, 1897, that era, first started in 1870, and then later um, officially incorporated in 1897, have been a key advisor to the U.S. Congress on copyright policy. We administer the registration and recordation systems of the United States. We administer other provisions of the law. Uh, and we have a public office that handles questions from the public. And uh, we have an international team that supports our colleagues across the U.S. government. Yeah. And uh, you talked about uh, uh, taking a, a more sort of step-by-step -step approach uh, to, the, to the review of copyright, because, of course, a full review uh, done all at the same time could take years. As you mentioned, the last one took uh, uh, around 20 years. Uh, and so uh, you talk about a holistic approach. And so do you, what, what do you think are, are the key areas that require uh, uh, some uh, uh, look at? So that's a great question. The, the key areas are uh, areas Congress has been debating for a long time. Uh, so they're not brand new. It's not as though everybody woke up one day and said we should look at the copyright law. So uh, full public performance right for sound recordings, orphan work solutions, um, innovative enforcement uh, mechanisms that may include a mix of, of legislation, private agreement, um, and uh, best practices, for example. Uh, flexible, flexibility, um, making the law more accessible to people who have to navigate it, uh, consumers, teenagers, uh, teenagers who are consumers, uh, educators, uh, people who, who really um, need guidance and who want to do the right thing. Uh, making sure that exclusive rights fit the way that, that works are made available to the public. Yeah. Um, if works are increasingly being streamed, do we have provisions that um, reflect that? Uh, not only on the scope of the exclusive rights, but also on the enforcement side. And uh, supporting robust licensing regimes. Uh, as we go forward into the digital age, licensing should be 
uh, painless, invisible if possible, expedient, efficient, and everybody will be well served. Those are just a few. Yeah, sure. And uh, you talked about uh, also, some, of course, the Copyright Office is a point of reference for uh, your congressmen that can ask you questions uh, that are both theirs and their constituents. So talk about some of the concerns that were expressed to you by congressmen. What are, you know, maybe a couple of the more interesting uh, stories or, or, you know, concerns that you've taken into account uh, when uh, thinking about this review? Well, yeah. So the so different congressional offices um, reach out to us on a range of, of questions. Some very big. What should the next great copyright act look like? Yeah. And then some very discreet. Uh, here are issues I'm hearing about in my district, uh, where I may have a university or I may have uh, a tech company, uh, where I have uh, a lot of authors uh, struggling. So. Yeah. Uh, we're very pleased by the level of interest and um, commitment by members who talk to us. Absolutely. They seem, um, in my view, to be very much aware that uh, authors uh, are having a difficult time making a living, that um, the internet has changed a lot, but that core principles of copyright must apply, yeah. uh, that it's important to culture and to commerce. They ask about um, DRM, they ask about orphan works, they ask about fair use, uh, they ask about licensing. Yeah. Um, I think there's not an area that they haven't asked us about. And then more philosophically, they ask questions like, why has the copyright debate become hostile? Yeah. How do we get back on track? Um, how do we get respect back into the system and how do we make it accessible to people who need it? And from politics to music, here's a short segment recorded with African music star Angelique Kitcho. That's the good, uh, the good and positive side of internet where people, most of the people that, doesn't, that didn't know my music before can go on internet today and discover my work and discover where I am in the world playing which is a good exposure because before you need the radio, you need the TV, you still need radio and TV today, but internet make it easier access for people to go and find out information yeah. about an artist. If they want to come to a show, they can go online and find out who I am before they come to the show. And uh, that is a good, very good part of it. But still, internet is a tool. We have to remember that it's a tool. Internet cannot replace people. So if we, if we all react and use internet in that mindset we might come to an agreement where we use it as a tool of knowledge a tool of entertainment but savvy savvy tool for everybody savvy users uh, conscious use, users because if we infringe on the right of other people we cannot say that there is democracy I mean technology does not mean we're not respecting other people's work and the moral value and the moral the morality of it is something that we have to bring back into this discussion and as a final extract from my coverage at the world creators summit here is my interview with robert ashcroft the chief executive at prs for music so let's start by talking about the, the global repertoire database there's been a lot of talk about that uh, in the last uh, couple of days and uh, people seem to be pretty excited about it even if it is a european driven uh, initiative uh, uh, that the us is really starting to take notice of it so uh, what, what are your feelings about the grd and what do you think now is the right time to, to get this going well, it's, it started off being European, really, because it was the first territory in which we were doing uh, pan-territorial licensing. And uh, in a split copyright world, you know, you suddenly find that that gets quite complicated. Already we're seeing global deals being done now. So uh, the, it, it might have started in Europe, but it's really just a technical problem of being able to issue an accurate invoice. Uh, for the works that are related to the sound recordings that have been streamed or downloaded or, or whatever. Yeah. And the, the numbers involved are so large that the only way of, of uh, calculating the, the correct amount of money to pay for the right owners is to automate the process. Yeah. And you can't automate it unless you have an accurate database. Otherwise, you get unmatched uh, usages. And the individual sums of money, particularly on streaming services or re-downloads for cloud locker services, are so small that you can't afford then to put manual labor into uh, expert matching. So you need an accurate database. Yeah. And uh, looking at uh, uh, the 
the world of data. Uh, you, you guys do an incredible job at uh, cleaning up the data that you have in your database and making sure that it's accurate and you can pay out uh, out your members. Uh, in terms of how this different database could coexist together into, into one unit, do, do you think uh, it's? Uh, are you optimistic about the chances of being able to find uh, a, a compromise where everybody's happy with the, with the, the end result? Yes, I'm, I think that we've done a lot of study in the design process and yeah. looking at all the, the, the process flows and uh, you know the uh, understanding who has the authoritative view of which version uh, is correct in which territory. There's been an awful lot of study of uh, that uh, in partnership with Deloitte uh, and the working group and, and all the various uh, people who've contributed to it. And we're looking now to September to kick it all off. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, very exciting, absolutely. And uh, looking at uh, the way in which uh, the GRD also brings people together at the same table, one conversation that I had today that was interesting was the fact that uh, aside from being an, an amazing project in itself, which is absolutely needed to be done, it's also a place where both technology companies and uh, 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 you know, rights holders and, and, and companies that work within the content industries are actually coming together at the, at the table in a sort of... Uh, solution focused environment and so they can get past some of the maybe the differences that there are between them anyway and so make better friends in a way as well well that's a process you know people yeah. people uh, come into a, a forum like that with uh, you know, some of their prejudices and the the uh, uh, the the attitudes that uh, that they bring to the table from a historical perspective and then the process of working together you suddenly find actually that you're solving a problem uh, and not uh, sort of looking at each other across the table as if you you are the problem yeah and uh, looking at uh, british music as, as an export of course we're here in the united states and british music is uh, huge so uh, how do you see uh, those revenues coming from overseas uh, in increasing over, over the past few years um, international revenue growth has been the source of our overall growth for uh, a number of years now uh, with the decline in recorded media uh, and the uh, slow increase in the, the domestic broadcast and online markets that's more or less been flat in total and, and our growth has come from international. Well, now we're finding that there are some areas of the world where we're still seeing revenue growth. Yeah. We're finding that our artists are being uh, ever more successful overseas. Yeah. Um, but we're also finding there are some markets that are in real trouble. The recession in Southern Europe is really biting. Uh, and we've seen some unfavorable results from the rate courts here in the United States. Uh, so there are some ups and some downs. Um, last year was uh, a challenge for us. We, uh, we didn't do quite as well as we were hoping and things are still looking a little tough. So there's two sort of elements. There's the balance between good and bad news, yeah. and that's been a little bit more on the bad news recently than on the good news. And against that, there's this underlying trend where we're doing it better, better exchange of data, better cooperation, uh, and that's got a slightly rising trend, and then the success of our artists. And that, in the last few years, has been absolutely unbelievable. If you think of Mumford & Sons, you think of Adele, you think it's just been, uh, think you know, the whole host of them. I mean, Emily Sandy this year, it's just been fantastic. And From the Sea Back to London, Music Connected, organized by the Association of Independent Music, was a great event, and I managed to record a bunch of short interviews with some of the panelists taking part. So, first up, here's my chat with Laura Kirkpatrick from Spotify. First of all, you know, uh, how significant is the independent sector for Spotify? I, I know that you've been one of the services that has been most... Uh, you know, uh, proactive in reaching out to independents. I would absolutely agree with that. I think they are a huge part of the ecosystem for us. Um, and we have very strong relationships with lots of indies and actually some of the most interesting campaigns that we do. Uh, for example, the Nick Cave um, app example that we talked about a little bit in the panel originate from indies. And I think that kind of freedom and that creativity that often... Um, comes from them and the entrepreneurial energy is, is absolutely vital to the innovation and, and trying new things on the service. Of course. And uh, you were talking about the social aspects of Spotify um, just then as a way to drive exposure for anybody, not just you know major acts absolutely. because of the way it works. Can you just elaborate on that? Absolutely. So I think what the um, social developments within Spotify really mean is that because every user will see a bespoke tailored homepage and experience, um, that means that you know it doesn't just have to be the big artists that are the most visible if you are an indie artist that just has a thousand followers that you've worked hard to build up on your profile on spotify by playlisting by driving um fans from other platforms that you may have essentially those fans are more valuable to you than a hundred thousand who aren't interested in what you're doing so that's really what our platform is um taking into consideration as, as we evolve 
and also from Music Connected, an extract of my chat with the digital marketing manager Lucy Blair. And uh, I mean, Sosano of course is a huge brand, you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere and of course you have to follow everything that's going on. <laughs> but what is the, your single biggest social channel at the moment? Um, our biggest channel is definitely well I guess it's between Facebook and YouTube because we have uh, we have two main Facebook pages but we have uh, several different YouTube channels um, but Facebook overall is probably our number one uh, looking at the the evolution of social media for music uh, of course Twitter music is something that is it's really been buzzing this week and we don't we don't yet know what's what 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 is going to be in your fantasy football sort of game of, uh, of social media and what what you'd like to see on the service mm. uh, what what do you expect what, what, what would you like to see oh such a good question um I, well first of all i hope they release it soon because i'm getting really annoyed with them the teasing <laughs> you're really really fed up with that yeah i just want to use it now um I mean, there's been a lot of speculation, obviously. There's been reports that um, the code in the Twitter Music page uh, shows integrations with SoundCloud and Spotify and various different streaming services, uh, which sounds great. Yeah. Um, I mean, personally, this is slightly veering off the question, but personally, in terms of online mu music services, I think there's a big issue of a lack of interoperability between them. Um, and I think it would actually be better for the music scene and better for artists and labels in general if the music services worked together more closely to cross-promote each other because ultimately it's only going to do the music industry uh, good. Um, but I really hope that it's going to... Um, lead to music, easier music discovery for a start obviously uh, better music creation across Twitter kind of not just relying on you know a hashtag um, and I guess ultimately from a marketing and sales point of view it'd be great if you can discover new music um, and then purchase directly within the app as well you know I guess that's the ultimate goal and finally a chat with Ebony Riney James head of digital marketing at Sony Music recorded at the ultimate seminar now, what do you feel like is the most important thing for young artists to look after when they're looking after their uh, digital properties uh, as you know as a young artist you know we're talking about uh, uh, with the creator of the BA uh, here Minister about the fact that uh, anybody can create a Twitter account but uh, and maintain it but it's very difficult to tie that into a strategy for a release so you know what is the most important thing for a young artists to look at when they're doing that I think one thing a lot of artists do is they try and have everything they want to have a Facebook they want to have a Twitter they want to have an Instagram and you know and actually some of those platforms don't work for all artists and I think things like Facebook for example are important in terms of um, you know people searching you out but there's no point in you having a Twitter account and only tweeting once or having nothing to say because people won't follow you um, so I think people need to be really clear about who the artist is it is that they are and what they want to achieve before they kind of make a decision about where what platforms they need to be on. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, looking at uh, you know the role of, uh, uh, of working at a major label uh, for, for such big artists as well. So, uh, how have things uh, changed uh, uh, in the last you know three four years uh, with uh, the rise of streaming services, for example? Has that changed uh, the strategies that you implement uh, for a release as well? Most definitely, and I guess one of the biggest changes is that we have less physical music stores so actually people being able to just go out and buy a record physically you know you don't have that option as much anymore um, and I was at the BPI yesterday actually and we were talking about in terms of you know the digital music's been around for say 10 years but actually there's still a huge range of people that don't buy music digitally um, and they might buy one compilation and then an hour compilation might do you know one of the now compilations will do 180,000 in a week because there are a lot of people that aren't necessarily um, dedicated to one artist to buy one album and actually they want something that's being curated and the catalogue market is very healthy. At Sony Music our catalogue department are amazing and we sell a lot of records off of the back of catalogue. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's different things. I think streaming is very important as well. It's a new revenue stream for us. Um, and I think that there are things that are happening. There's a lot of talk about YouTube subscription service, which will again change the way in which people are consuming music, say on YouTube or other platforms. Um, yeah, we have to, you know, especially within digital marketing, it's constantly evolving. So it's def we definitely have to change our strategy to move with the market. Of course, looking at digital marketing as well, uh, I hear people uh, sometimes say that, you know, it's no longer digital marketing, it's just marketing. <laughs> Did you agree with that? Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I try not to work in isolation. So, you know, there's this thing now called multi-screen viewing. You know, when you're watching a TV show, 
you're often on your iPad or your phone at the same time or your laptop or your desktop. And I think it's detrimental to think about marketing or advertising in one way. And I think it's very much adjoined. I think, you know, we all specialize in our areas, but the plan is, for, you know, I want you to be able to see someone on TV and then automatically go online and be able to do something. And maybe you just go online and watch their video. And then you go to the supermarket the next day and you buy the record. It's not about, you know, one channel. It's about everything, you know, working together as one and all elements are really important. Absolutely. And it's also the case that in the last few years, because of uh, you know this segmentation of the audience as well, uh, things have changed in the sense that there's no longer a one formula fits all uh, to release an album. You really have to think really carefully about who the audience is of the new artists that you have. For example, we, we saw Laura Mavula do incredibly well this year. And so I guess all of that marketing campaign was based around who the audience was, who do you wanted to reach, and how you went about doing that. Yeah, I think if you talk about Laura Mavula specifically, she's an artist who's very original. Um, she knew what music she wanted to make, and she didn't bend that for anything. Um, I think that you know Sony have signed her knowing what she was about, and that was a risk. Oh, from my perspective, that's a risk because she's not an obvious artist. You can't say, well, she fits here, um, and this is a radio station she'll be on. On and you know, but they were very creative. And Nadine um, Pesod, who I work with at Sony as well, very creative marketing campaign. Um, I'm currently working on an artist called Foxes, um, who is amazing, and you know, we see great things from her in 2014. She's done features with Zed on Clarity and also with Rudimental. Um, where she got one audience off the back of those collaborations. She also has her own core fan base. And recently we got a sync with Debenhams, which has increased her fan base by a whole new, you know, we, we're getting a whole new demographic of an audience off the back of that. So it's multi-tiered in that way. And you've done a similar thing with Everything Everything, of course, last year. Uh, yeah, so I don't work Everything Everything directly, but again, that, you know, is a really interesting campaign, I think. Um, you know, creatively, I'm obsessed with you know the way in which they are they they're being marketed as well. You know, and then more recently with RCA again, I don't work this band, but Codaline. Um, you know, and me working with the Associated Labels Division, we've got acts like Don Broco, who are a rock act, but very much um, can cross over into the mainstream in terms of, um, you know, the potential of the band as well. And that's all for this recap of DMT's coverage of conferences around the world in 2013. I really hope you enjoyed this show, and I'd really like to thank you for your support of DMT throughout 2013. 2014 is going to be an amazing year in digital music, so stay tuned to keep up with all the latest. The normal DMT panel show will resume next week. Thanks so much for listening, have a great week and until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.